Hello, gang. Advertising design class. I'm going to share my desktop here real quick. I got to pop back into uh, my Canvas so we can kind of start talking about advertising design, talk a little bit about the structure of the modules, talk a little bit about the textbook, and kind of get the ball rolling here. Advertising design is specifically raster based, it is Photoshop. Graph Design 1, we touch on it a little bit, some of the techniques of Photoshop. We use Adobe Press, which is the Adobe certified books. Uh, Graph Design 2, we piggyback on that a little bit to get some more kind of uh, uh, different Adobe processes and things like this. This course uh, exposes you to some of the real world applications of Photoshop, real professional design solutions using fun, different little tricks and techniques using uh, our tricks, our Photoshop tricks book. Uh, and our principles of Photoshop book. So this one goes into a little bit more niche type stuff. Each week I'm gonna do lectures on different ways over the 25 plus years I've been using Photoshop that I've really kind of found a groove in doing certain things that give you some very professional kind of features and techniques and different things like that. Uh, sometimes it'll be exactly the same process that the designer that wrote our books does and sometimes it's just ways you know there's more than one way to skin a cat so there's different ways to do things to get the same treatment and techniques right everyone kind of uses programs slightly differently uh, i think i told you in like graphic design one class i've had designers use literally illustrator for everything they've ever had to create for me if they were working for me which is kind of a scary thought but they were able to do it very effectively uh there's programs specific for different tasks, but it doesn't mean you can't be very creative with how you use these programs uh, and create the same solutions or the same results. Photoshop is raster based. We've talked about it before. Uh, it is pixel based, which means we need good images. Your Photoshop tricks book has beautiful images. I mean, I put the uh, zip file out there for you in uh, the start here modules so you can download it. You don't have to go to the book or anything like that. Uh, yeah, they're beautiful. I mean, they're really high quality images. In our lecture, I think we'll go to Pexels and we'll download some different things. Uh, in the past, I've taken some of the photos from the book and manipulated them in different ways during the lectures. But sometimes students get a little confused with the file that we used in the lecture versus the file they're using to submit whatever technique they're learning in the book. So in the last few years, I guess I'd say, I've started to migrate towards downloading some high quality images and playing around on our own and doing different things. And if we cover techniques that are covered in the book, you can give me the lecture file back. You don't have to give me the textbook file back. I just wanna be able to see that you can apply textures. You know what an overlay filter is. You know how to stack layers. You know how to do clipping masks. Just basic techniques that we're gonna build upon. Designers have their own way of doing things. And as they learn programs, they get in a groove for stylistically how they like to do things. So you'll see a graphic designer, digital designer, whatever you wanna call the person, uh, social media guru, and they'll have things that they like to do and they do very well and they do them over and over again. I have a very good friend of mine in the neighborhood who is a photographer. He got an associate's degree, I think about 150 years ago at uh, Edison College, which is now FSW. Um, and he has his own business and he does specifically real estate photography. That's all he does. And he makes an absolute killing at it. The guy is busy 24 hours a day, drives a fancy Tesla the whole nine yards. Um, but he set up a process for processing images in Photoshop. He does the exact same thing every single time to every single picture. So if you ever go and look at a classified ad, a, a sales ad online for a house in the Naples, Fort Myers, Estero area, if it looks a certain way, Jim did every single photo in there. I mean, I think if I would ask him to do something different outside of his bubble, he would be like absolutely confused, right? Because he found a process and a style that he really likes. And so once you do that, you fall into a groove. With that being said, design I, the way you see things, the way you manipulate images, the way you play around is unique to you. And in many cases, it's unique to an industry. So if you wanna be a marketing manager, you wanna be a creative director, you wanna be a designer, you wanna be a social media person, you wanna be a web person, you wanna be anyone in the creative arts. As you learn programs and you get comfortable seeing things in the world, you're gonna naturally gravitate towards things you like visually, things you feel comfortable doing, and the process to go about doing those. And I always tell the students in class, right? I can give a long list of examples of students I've had in class over the years and where their career has taken them. 
And 99.9% .9 of the time, their initial interest in class might not end up being where they are, A. And B, their style they develop, the uniqueness of them, whether it's uh, critiquing, whether it's doing, whether it's just analyzing, they naturally fit into some style or interest. So as we play in Photoshop, I always like to give you some level of step-by-step, -step, some level of lecture where we do things, how I've done over the years, how I've been exposed to, how I've learned, different ways I've seen people do things over the years, combined with a designer that produces a book and kind of gives you the ways that they like to do things. There's more than one way. And then your out of book projects, how you see, how you create, how you do, how you compose, how you use the program and kind of that little niche we find somewhere in the middle of all this chaos. So uh, lectures will always be our own pictures. We'll do some different things. I'll cover the topics of your book, but I'll kind of show you different ways to do it. Sometimes the step-by-step -step of the book, sometimes not the step-by-step -step of the book, but the same result just so that you can see. And if you feel comfortable with how I do any given step-by-step, -step, use it for the step-by-step -step of the book. Like if, you, if we do a, if we draw shapes, create a merge shape and we clip an image out of that shape and we do it in class and you feel like that's a really process that I understand and I can replicate and I can do over and over again, feel free to give it to me for masking for the book. I don't, you don't have to do it the way he does it. It's a really clear way, hopefully, as we go through the process of doing it or a reinforcing way, but it's not the only way. So I just wanna make sure that you feel comfortable with what we're creating, how it looks and the process we went through, whether it's step-by-step -step or whether it's watching this recording over and over and over again until you figure it out. Either way, everyone learns a different way. That's why everyone likes to take technology and has coursework. They can follow the book if they want to. I have students that never log into the lecture. They just follow the book. They create the projects. Uh, I have the, oh my gosh, I'm never going to be able to do this. And by the end, they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I could do this, right? I get that holy motion going in the course, uh, coursework, any given coursework. Uh, and I have ones that just like to follow along and play it over and over and over again until they kind of see how this thing works. Uh, so whatever works for you, okay? All right, so that's the end of the pitch for advertising design. So that brings us into uh, the structure of the class. There's only a couple of you in here. Uh, so we're gonna kind of build as we go and see how you guys do and prod you along. And it's kind of nice when you only have a couple of, couple of students in the class because then we can kind of really emphasize what we need to learn and what you like and kind of what you're seeing in the build process. Uh, so that'll be really good. And we can kind of stay on top of it. I wanna make sure that you're, if you're not logging in live, that you're watching the recording, that you're not just freewheeling it out uh, without having any kind of support direction from me. Uh, so make sure even if you're just following the books that you at least watch the recording because I might actually do something that you find interesting that isn't, that is related to the book, but isn't related to the book. It's a technique like the book, but maybe something I expand upon in my design career over the years. So uh, remember the announcement section is my jam. So I'm going to try to be posting stuff in here. I already have one, two, three, four things posted, and we've only been in this session for three days. So just know that I love doing that. This is really cool. I don't know if you took the time to take a look at this, but man, I, I, I'm not a, I, I am a Photoshop guy. I mean, if, if it's my preference, I'm drawing an illustrator, I'm creating logos, I'm making illustrations, that's my thing. Uh, I've collected and drawn in sketchbooks since as long as I can remember. I think I have a library of like 200 and some sketchbooks that I've kept from when I was like four, five, six, seven, eight years old, all the way up till now. I still draw on a piece of paper when we have meetings here, entertain myself while we're having meetings. Uh, so I like to draw, but second, I would say a close second is photo manipulation. So anytime I see something that I think is fun or cool or different, uh, like the uh, uh, Sherwin-Williams commercials, you ever see those with the uh, paint swatches and they make them into butterflies and cars and all kinds of stuff. Uh, that's pretty cool. They're really cool as ads too. When they take the paint swatches, the paint sticks, and they make iguanas and lizards and all kinds of stuff out of them. So if I see something I think that's cool, I'm going to share it with you. Like last night we were doing... Um, what I have last night, portfolio. Uh, and we were talking about Duffy, De Duffy Design Agency in Minneapolis, which is Duffy.com. They do some really cool portfolio case studies. There's some really cool inspiration there too. So if I stumble or I cross breed or I cross reference and I just see things that are cool, uh, 
I'm going to share it. Like uh, the new app that's the craze of the day. Have you heard about this Be Real? So every so often during the day, you get a message from the app Be Real, and you have to take an unfiltered photo of what's going on in your life at that time. And you have two minutes to do it. And it's basically a raw image share amongst a group of people, followers, that you can't use filters, you can't use anything. It's just the real caption of your life at any point in time, kind of like Snapchat, I guess. Uh, and I don't know how long it disappears before it disappears, but interesting concept. No filters, no effects, no cropping, no nothing. You just snap it, you post it, your friends see it. Oh, there's Chip having a cheeseburger at the local restaurant here on a Saturday afternoon at two o'clock. And then in a couple of minutes, it disappears. And I guess you get kind of some naughty message if you don't post in the two minute window, like, hey, everybody's waiting to see what you're up to. It has no icon. I mean, the app actually says be real on the icon that downloads on your phone. Like this person launched this thing and it's gone viral and there's no branding whatsoever to it. So it goes to show you that the idea of photo manipulation and making something look surreal and like too good to be true, there's another side to that coin, the raw nature of photography. So I'm going to show you a bunch of tricks and all kinds of things to make things look cool and hyper real and virtual and all this stuff. But there is something to be said for just a nice image collage of raw pictures that haven't been touched and manipulated. So just remember to check that. I do have a lecture from, what is this, April 2021, when I was doing some advertising design lecturing. Uh, I'm going to try to post some pre-lectures for you, where I just kind of show you some things I've been doing over the last year or so when we talk about raster-based design. Uh, you can watch that too if you're interested in it. Uh, it's just kind of a preview of different things. And I do cover different topics depending on what the current trends in industry are and kind of what is happening in the world of Photoshop right now, but just keep that in mind. Uh, okay, so we're gonna go down here to the module section, uh, your, uh, your chapter images I've attached right down here. Remember you access your digital book from this link here. I've had both of you in class before, so you already know the shtick, how, how things go uh, in the process of accessing material. Just know that it's there in the start here. So you don't have to download it. Your book does tell you how to download it also. And there are some assets online for the author of your tricks book where he posts some different things on his website and stuff like that. It's kind of cool. I mean, I know one of the first uh, tours, quotation marks, I did, and it was actually in grad school, is we went to a studio in New York City of this guy that was a Photoshop genius, apparently, and he did all kinds of weird, uh, dark imagery, but he had created a style, kind of like my friend that does real estate, and he just took photos of people and churned out the same dark, highlighted process in all the images, and he actually showed us in his lab. He took like 15 minutes and clicked through the process he did on an image, and he had created like his own style and he was all over Time Magazine and all kinds of stuff. The guy made an absolute career out of like a seven click process of processing photos in a way that was dark and dreary and different. And it was interesting. So uh, hopefully you get some level of photo inspiration from this class. Maybe it's just to, you know, make pictures of your family look a little bit better or quotation marks better uh, or uh, clean up some images that you have from family history. Right. You have all these pictures from great, great grandparents or, you know, family from multi-generation and you just want to make things uh, clean them up and look, make them look better and, and more current to today and saturate the colors a little bit and do the things you might like to do. Uh, everybody always asks me to clean up old pictures. Oh, I got this picture that was in a shoebox. It's all creased and this, and it's missing part of the image or the guy that took it had his thumb on the lens. So everything's super dark. Can you pull all the saturation out of the image and make it brighter so it looks clearer? Just know if the image is burned white, there's no pixels behind it. So if the sun is really shiny on an image and it burns part of the pixels out, there's nothing there. If it's super dark, there is stuff there. It just means it's hidden under the saturation of the image and you actually can pull those out. So if you ever saw the latest phones, all they're doing is taking dark mode and they're enhancing the saturation of the camera aperture and it's pulling those pixels out. So if it's burned in, you ain't getting it back. If it's dark, you can pull the saturation out of that and you can actually make the image look like it was taken in daylight when it was taken in the dark, in essence. So, and cameras have gotten really smart about that. So, 
yearbook has textures and clipping masks and three step-by-step -step projects to submit for week one. Uh, and then a travel poster where we get to apply some of the things, some basic steps that we learn from some of the, you know, I, I don't wanna say uh, probably intermediate, a little bit more intermediate process in Photoshop. Uh, the beauty about Photoshop, like anything, is that, man, there's a million ways to do things. We just wanna make that the quality of the image is appropriate that it's high resolution, that it looks professional and that it's clean, right? We wanna make sure it's clean. So if we're cutting out images or we're feathering images in or making a clipping mask, we wanna make sure there isn't any weird little white borders around the images, or we didn't cut it out cleanly, or we can see some lingering, what we call widow marks in the image where maybe you erased part of the image, but there are some pixels left that you didn't recognize or notice. So we wanna make sure the images are clean that they look professional and that we use a process that we can replicate over and over again. Uh, beyond that, there's lots of ways to do things and we're gonna play around with them tonight. So uh, three chapters, not, not a lot, three chapters. Uh, so maybe three or four hours to do the three chapters, hopefully, hopefully. And then, and, and then hopefully a weekend to play around with your out of book. I tell every student, if you can get the step-by-step, -step, a few of the chapters done during the week, give yourself the weekend to play. Cause I'm hoping the out of book projects are inspirational and are fun and are things that you wanna kind of hunt and peck around and play around with. And maybe wow your family members when you get done building something, they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did that. You're a genius in Photoshop, All right? I get that every single day, not. My, my wife says, Chip gets paid to make pretty pictures. And my kids are like, what is a graphic designer? <laughs> so I'm like, maybe you want to do it someday. So hopefully you get a little inspiration in class. So uh, it's just about commercial effects this week. We're going to take a look at uh, color balance and hue and saturation. We're going to look at layers. We're going to look at masking. We're going to uh, blend some pictures together. We're going to do some different things just so that you can kind of see how it works uh, at, at like a advanced basic intermediate level, something you can replicate over and over again. And then if you wanna watch the recording over and over again, you can. But a lot of these things I just do over and over and over again on a daily basis, because it's what clients ask for, it's what they want. So let's dive into Photoshop, right? We already know the, you know where to access the book. You know that I put student files out there. You know the submission process of clicking on the icon and giving me the project. It's Photoshop, so you can give me a JPEG or a PDF or some compressed level of file that's smaller versus giving me the .psd file. So if you wanna do a file save as and give me a JPEG because you got a slower internet connection at home and it would take you three days to upload a Photoshop file, but a JPEG you can upload in three minutes. It's okay if you give me a JPEG or some compressed file, a PNG, or a PDF file. If you choose PDF file, Photoshop PDF file, you can choose smallest file size. You don't have to give me press quality or high quality images. I can see the compression rate of the image and I can see if you did the technique that's necessary uh, to learn the basic skill in Photoshop. So whatever compression file wise works best for you is perfectly fine for me. I don't want you to be sitting there for three days trying to upload a chapter three project file to me uh, because it takes that long at home. I wanna kind of keep as much as we can local. So when you're working on files that are a little bit bigger, you already have the stuff downloaded to your computer or to a thumb drive. Uh, so we can like minimize speed issues as people are around the world working on things. Uh, sometimes I have students in other countries and they just don't have great internet connections and places in this country don't have great internet connection, but uh, gives them a chance to kind of work on them offline and give me the JPEGs or the PNGs. So three projects out of the book, uh, the Photoshop tricks book this week and your out of book uh, project. Your out of book project is a travel poster. Uh, and this is a, a chance to just have fun. So we're gonna play around with mountains and animals and things to start this process where you're kind of doing uh, 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 an artificial world in essence uh, as kind of a topic, like a, a imaginative travel poster. So 
I do watch a lot of the History Channel and some of the stuff they cover in there, I think is artificial too. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of an interesting topic or project. So uh, this week we'll play around with that. So the first thing we have to do is we have to get some imagery. So let's, uh, let's go out and grab some pictures because I don't like using the same pictures in the book. It's baseball photos and stone textures and different things like that. Let's go out and grab some different things. So let's just start in pixels. We can download a high resolution picture and we're gonna start just manipulating a background image, just showing you what filters do, what different effects do, different ways to apply things to things to make images look more enhanced and surreal and things like that. And then we'll add some patterns to, to text and we'll do some clipping masks and different things, uh, but we'll start with some background imagery kind of give you a baby step start to your out of book project. Uh, so let's go in and let's do mountain. Let's just type in the word mountain. And you actually don't have to have the exact same picture as me if you don't want to. You can do the step-by-step -step process with something, a different picture if you're inspired by it. So if you rather do a safari instead of mountains, I'm okay with that. I actually thought about a safari at first because I was like, that would be kind of interesting, do a safari. Uh, so uh, let's take like, this picture right here is a beautiful picture. So if you like that one, you can grab that one. We're gonna do the same techniques. We're gonna just color balance. We're gonna do different things to the image to kind of enhance the image and play around with it. So maybe we'll just, I'm gonna grab this one right here because I think it's pretty, it's pretty beautiful. It's kind of a kind of a duotone, what they call a duotone technique where it's like reds and black as your primary tones in your image kind of gives you that Instagram kind of effect. In essence, that's what Instagram does. It turns your image into a duotone or a tritone is what the te technical term is. So let's click on there. And remember, it's always best practice. So I'm gonna drag this image over to the desktop. So however you wanna get it on the desktop, uh, I'm gonna dump it over there. Uh, and I'm gonna make a folder on my desktop. So if you're working in the process, the same process as me, make sure that you are creating a folder. So I'm just gonna name my folder add design. So I know everything that I put in that folder is for this class. I'm gonna dump the mountain picture in first and I'm gonna minimize uh, the Pexel site so that I don't, I'm just gonna mess around with this photo for a while, just so that we don't get sensory overload as it relates to different techniques and textures and different things we're doing, so. Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna open that picture up in Photoshop. So however you do it, file open, you drag it down to Photoshop. If you're a Mac person and you drag that image into there and you get this really beautiful picture. Oh my gosh, it is a really beautiful picture. That's a hundred percent. Like this is a really a beautiful image. Okay. Uh, so the first thing we're going to deal with is this concept of background layer, right? We talked about it in, in basic graphic design class. We've got to release this thing from its lock. You see, when you open an image, it's a background layer. Well, the background layer limits some of the things we can do because it's frozen, right? It's an image that's in the background. The first thing I like to do, I like to build background to foreground. I like to unlock or make this thing a layer, right? So when I click on this image, I can't do anything with it, but you see how it actually asked me, hey, do you wanna make this a regular layer? I do, but I traditionally do it by right-clicking on the layer and just doing layer from background. And remember, I'm a big believer in naming layers. So let's name it mountains if we're unlocking this thing. It's important to unlock it because look now, I can move this thing. And you should remember from basic graphic design class that checkerboard means transparent, right? So that means it's a transparent background. So it's good. Can I go back and lock this now? Absolutely. But I can also unlock it. It isn't frozen because it was an image that was a PNG or a JPEG or a TIFF or anything like that when you first opened it. If you take a picture, uh, a family photo, and the photographer or you're the photographer, you open it up in Photoshop, it's going to be a locked PNG or JPEG or whatever. The first thing you always want to do with background layers is release them from the lock. Make them a normal layer that you can manipulate. That's really important because a lot of the filters, effects, blend modes, the things we wanna do require the layer to have access to the pixels, not be locked. So I never, literally never have a background layer that is locked. 
if I have a layer that's locked at all, it's because I do file new and I set up a letter size piece of paper or whatever I'm working on and I create this layer. If it's a blank canvas, this thing, it's locked. If it's an image I'm gonna blend and stack things on top of, it is unlocked. The only canvas I ever have that's locked is a solid color, which is the piece of paper, the artboard, the canvas that we're building on top of. So if I needed to make this a poster 11 by 17, I would start with a new document in print mode, which is a tabloid, and I would make it a locked layer that I bring these images into, right? So we're gonna just unlock that layer and we're gonna play around with it. Now, a really good best practice is to always keep the original image raw as a layer. Anything I do to the image is a duplicate copy of the original image I brought into Photoshop as a raw image. So I wouldn't go in here now and manipulate this image and this be the only image in my layer sequence of the photo of the mountains. Why is that important? It's important because if I clip part of the mountain, if I just color in one part of the mountain, I decide to texture part of the mountain, I always have the original full scale image inside of my layer sequence. That way, if I don't like something I did and it happens to be a permanent process, I can always go back and make a duplicate layer again of the original. It doesn't mean I don't do that and hide it once I start building stacks on top of each other to do some of the effects you do in your book. You got baseball players, you got tennis courts, you got tennis balls, you got all kinds of things you're working on. I, I open that file and I leave the original mountain image in there and I hide it and I start duplicating layers and doing things with the mountain. Now, some really just easy steps to think of when you are manipulating images in Photoshop. There's a couple of different areas, right? Under image, you have simple things like modes. So the modes of an image are RGB, which is color mode for web, CMYK, which is color mode for print, grayscale, which is just black and white grayed out lack of color saturation uh, image. And those are the three that you're gonna mess around with the most. When you hear about photographers shooting in raw format, raw format just means that it gives you access to multi-channel layer detail. So when you shoot a raw image, a really big image, you actually have multi-lens or multi-layer images. And in those layers are different levels of color detail, color saturation. So when you shoot in raw, you're getting literally every layer of lens detail coming out of an image that's taken from a camera or from a phone. And it's really scary. You can get some really raw detail out of a photograph you take even with your iPhone. I mean, it's really scary how the world has changed. Uh, but for the sake of what you get from a stock site, what you get from a clip art, what you get from a photographer, if they take the photos for you and render the photos to give you for advertising purposes, you're gonna get a TIFF, a JPEG, a PNG, sometimes a Photoshop file if they did some manipulation, you're not gonna get multi-channel. So just be comfortable with that idea that those are kind of the three color modes that you're gonna see from an image that you get from a photographer. Okay, now we're gonna do some just basic image mode adjustments just so that you can see how the process works. And then we're gonna move over to some different techniques for kind of manipulating and exposing the image to different things. So you can see what you can do with just a straight background image. We're not doing any fancy, any clips yet. We're not masking anything. We're not hiding part of the image. We're just manipulating in kind of a basic color mode environment. So you can see the different things that you can do with an image. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and right click on this image and we're gonna duplicate the layer. So we're gonna right click on it and duplicate the layer. We've already released it. It's in an RGB color mode. So we're just gonna release this and duplicate it. But instead of it duplicating it inside this right now, kind of untitled image, we're gonna make a new copy of it. We're gonna make a new copy 
as a new document. And the reason we're doing that is because I just wanna show you the differences of color mode and how you can blend the differences of color mode. So we're strictly dealing with color mode right now. And then we'll kind of get into techniques for cropping and cutting and clipping and doing different things in images. But a lot can be done just with adjusting color mode. Okay, so we're gonna go in and we're gonna create a new image. So this is a new document. So you're gonna see untitled at the top and you're gonna see the photo that we opened from Pexels over here, the standard old JPEG, right? The reason we did that is because I wanna go in here and I wanna go in to my color mode and I wanna make it grayscale just so that you can see what happens. And it's actually asking you, do you want to strip the color detail out of your image, right? Yeah, we want to do that. Just so that you can see the difference, there's still the depth of pixel density, but we just removed the color from it, right? That's all we did, just remove the color from it. Just so that you can see RGB color saturation and grayscale. Now, the reason I also did that is because oftentimes in design, you will see areas of an image that are in grayscale mode and areas of an image that are in color mode. And the reason they do that is to control the focal point. Where you look in an image, the important area of the image is more saturated, more developed, uh, more color balance versus less saturation, removing of color detail, removing of color saturation. So I thought it would be fun to go in and strip the color out of an image and bring it back into the image that does have color. So now that we switch this to grayscale, we're gonna go in and we're gonna duplicate this layer and take it back to the original image. So let's take that mountains and let's move it back to the original image. So now you're gonna see there's grayscale and there is color, right? The reason I did that is because you can't strip the color mode of a layer. You're stripping the color mode of a document. So if I want to strip out the color saturation of an image, I need to do that as its own image and bring it in as a layer into the color mode of dominance, the image that's most dominant. So we stripped out the color as a new image and brought it in as a new layer on top of the original image. So all we did was change the color mode as a layer, as, an, as its own image and bring it in as a layer in the color mode image. So now we have both layers generated. So the new image, we made image mode grayscale and then we took that and we duplicated that layer over to the original RGB image. So we picked the original RGB image and clicked OK. And if we go up to our Photoshop tab, we should have a new grayscale image over top of the color image. Are we okay? Are we okay? Not yet? just for if you want to combine grayscale and color modes. If you wanted to go RGB to CMYK, 
that can all happen in the same file because it's both full color. It's just three versus four. So this is a trick you see a lot in advertising where they bring in color saturation over a muted, a duotone, a monochromatic image, which is what this is, a tritone, that kind of thing. So just know you can always have multiple copies open in Photoshop with different color modes, but you wanna duplicate the layers into one file if you want one file to be dominant. So like in this case, the color is the dominant, we stripped the color out in a file and brought it in as its own layer. So I'm actually going to trash this layer because I have two of them. So now you're going to notice that there's two layers here. It's file management. So let's make this one mountains underscore red, green, blue, RGB. And let's make this one mountains underscore BW. Right, and these are my raw files. So we're just dealing with raw files. So we're just combining color modes now. And you can see that I have one in black and white and one in color, All right? I can click on the eyeball, one in black and white, one in color. Now, your book talks about uh, your layer styles, your layer effects that you have going on in the images you're working on. It actually has you bring in a crackle texture and make the player all crackled. And the concept behind that is you're stacking one layer of texture on top of one layer of image and you're messing around with the layer filter that is set. And overlay is the one that you do in your book. And now look what just happened to my color image when I put an overlay of black and white on top of it. So. That's what the image looks like. Watch when I choose the black and white and I choose overlay. Look at how highly saturated the shadow has become in that image. An overlay takes the dominant elements of the layer on top of the other layer and it enhances them on top of that image. So that's how you get this super shadowy technique that really creates like ultra high contrast. This is actually a technique that guy I was talking to you about that was making all these really dreary things. He was taking pictures of people's faces up close and he was taking a highly saturated image, RGB, super brightness contrast. And he was making a layer in grayscale and he was doing an overlay of the grayscale of the person's face and the high color saturation. And it made like horror posty, poster, like really drastic heavy metal. And that actually was his industry. He was doing imagery for like rock bands and heavy metal music. And he was making all this super contrasty enhanced stuff. But just take a look as we scroll through the different layers and what happens to the image that is color underneath. So keep in mind, this is black and white, right? So I'm just scrolling through all of the different layer styles of this image and what it does to the image underneath. Wow, this is really weird, isn't it? It's like an X-ray. And the reason I chose grayscale is because it's black and it's white. So when you choose these effects, you get the biggest contrast at times because it's black and white versus overlaying two different images on top of each other, not the same images, and they're both color. Sometimes when you do that, depending on the saturation of the two images, you see very little adjustment. So like the texture image that you overlay over the player in the book at times can appear very subtle because of the two equal saturation of the color images. So I always like in my texture show black and white on top of color. And what happens when you do soft light, so you can see it right there versus hard light. You should be able to see the difference in detail from soft light to hard light to vivid light, right? There's a big drastic difference. This is like, whoa, like this is, looks like it could have been taken by the rover on Mars, 
I mean, like that is a serious, but there's a place for it, right? That's why you always start with the original image and then you do overlays or techniques on top of the original image. I wanna make sure I have the original photo of the mountains, pure, perfect, raw as layer zero, bottom layer, and then anything I do on top of that. So now you can Im immediately think about the travel poster. Man, I wanna make a tropical place and I wanna call it like, uh, I don't know, some uh, uh, Tropicana Island or something, right? This artificial place. But if you take a picture of blue water and you make a grayscale version of that and you layer it on top and you make a vivid or a hard contrast, you're gonna make this thing look like it has the deepest, bluest, most cross saturated image like that you could ever imagine. Well, guess what? They do that every single day and I don't wanna make any jokes. Maybe if you're visiting Jamaica or <laughs> any of the really beautiful islands, that water looks pretty amazing. And yes, in person, it is really amazing. <laughs> but they definitely enhance the overlay of that image to make it even better. I mean, I, you can see it here. I go to Barefoot Beach all the time. That, that's beautiful water. But if you ever see an ad for Naples or any of the beaches, that water is like unbelievable in the ads. And it is unbelievable, right? They're doing the same technique we're doing here. They're just doing it to enhance what is there. So it's not really cheating it because you're just pulling out the depth of the image by laying an overlay over the top of it. But it is kind of cheating a little bit because it isn't really that green, right? You got to have like a camera with an open aperture in the whole nine yards to get it to look like that. So, all right. So we're just going to, I'm going to go in here and let's just see what we have here. Let's, uh, I'm just going to do overlay. So you'll notice that when I choose overlay, it changes up here, but there's no adjustment to the fact that it's black and white down here, right? So you have to know one of the places you're looking is for the layer effect setting, normal versus overlay to know that the difference is happening. So if I turn that off, it's back to normal, right? It did not change the fact that this thing is black and white. So at later date, I didn't love that. I would just have to go back to normal and all of the detail is still there. This is just setting a layer setting so that I'm getting the effect that I want. So if you're editing a file, you're a creative director, marketing manager, you get a fly, file, you're looking at it, you gotta know that if it looks like this, the default is to look up here to make sure there isn't some kind of adjustment. And then from there, you have the option of allowing light through it, which is called opacity to soften this thing up. So you see, if I go to zero, it's non-existent. If I go to 27%, you start to see it. If I go to 70%, it gets a little darker. If I go to 100%, it's the full saturation of the image. There's no light shining through it. So think of like a piece of printer paper. If the image is printed on there, it's 100% opacity. You can't see through the paper. If there is a level of opacity, it means it's printed on a piece of clear plastic. And the amount of ink on the plastic is the level of the opacity. So if it's very lightly printed on the plastic, you're talking about a number that's down here. If it's very heavily printed, saturated on the plastic, you're talking about a number up here closer to 80, 90, or 100%. Also know that piece of plastic that's stacked on top of itself is the way that movie animations were made back in the day. They were called cells. The paint was painted on the cell and they stacked it based on what they wanted to see through the camera based on the number of cells stacked on top of each other. And if there was no paint on the cell, that meant there was zero opacity. There was nothing there. If there was a character painted on that cell, it was 100% opacity, which meant it was covering up the image underneath. Now, we're gonna do a bunch of little basic overlays here so you can just see what it looks. We're still in the background, right? I build background to foreground, so we're still in the background. We're just gonna build copies of our RGB and adjust the copies of our RGB and kind of blend this picture together. So now we're gonna go down to our eraser tool. So you see this little eraser tool down here that looks like the old eraser that you used as a kid with the 
pencil with the little nub on the top of it, we're going to go down to the eraser tool because something you need to understand about Photoshop, critical part of Photoshop, that everything is based on a circle. Everything is based on a circle, which we call a brush, whether you're painting, drawing, stamping, erasing, selecting, everything is based on a circle, the size of the circle and the blend of the circle. So if we're painting, drawing, selecting, cloning, erasing, smudging, blurring, any of the techniques in Photoshop are based on a circle. And also know that in Photoshop, all of the presets for any given tool are at the top. So if we're doing a magic wand, if we're doing a paintbrush, if we're doing an eraser tool, if we're smudging it, if we're blurring it, if we're blending it, they all have this little thing up at the top, which is the brush circumference of the tool that you're on. Now, Something you need to know about the brush. The brush has a hardness to the edge. It has a size and a hardness. And think about it this way. First off, it's the brush size, right? So when you go to Michael's and you buy a brush, you got a little skinny brush, you got a little big brush, a little bit bigger brush, right? Depending on the job, you have to know what the size of the point is on the brush that you're using, that you're painting or drawing with. So the first thing is the brush size. So as you go down, obviously it gets a pinhead size. As you crank it up, it gets really big. And this brush goes really big. And keep in mind, this is a really big image. It's 47 meg. It's very high detailed image. So I'm gonna just crank it down to like, I don't know, let's go to like, and it doesn't matter if it's the exact number. Let's go to like 500, somewhere in the ballpark of 500. You could type it in here if you wanted to, 500, hit enter. Then we have it at 500, or you can just kind of do the little slider and get it close to 500. It doesn't really matter to me. Now, the hardness of the brush, think of it like an airbrush, right? You ever see the people at the old boardwalks and stuff? They make t-shirts and they paint it and they hook up a little color to it and they spray it. That's how they spray a car, right? They have this little compressor with air that blows through it. And however hard the air is blowing through is how firm the color is that comes out of the airbrush. In essence, the hardness is the amount of direct paint color is being blown into a spot on the image. So as you soften the edges of the brush, the hardness goes down. As you firm up the edges of the brush, more pure like a Sharpie, the number goes down. So Sharpie, number down, watercolor, painting on a piece of paper and it's bleeding all over the place, number goes up. So take a look at this number. So we're just gonna go to like, oh, let's go to 50%. Now, we're gonna take that 50%. I'm gonna click the little arrow so it tucks the palette there so you don't see it over your image. Remember, we're on the black and white image, right? The black and white image. So watch if I take my mouse and I'm gonna take it right off of the page here. And I'm gonna go right up to this corner. I'm gonna click and hold my mouse down and I'm gonna rub it across the page. So I'm just gonna click and put my mouse down and rub it across the page. And I'm gonna zoom in, command plus, right? Zoom in. I'm gonna use my space bar, just to kind of move it up a little bit. You're gonna notice that this image was erased from that area. So watch when I click. So you see that you can see the original image at the top, but the new overlaid image underneath of it sitting. So watch when I just rub my brush across. I'm actually removing the overlay image. And watch if I hide this. You see how that's taken away from the image? Now, if I zoom in, look at how sharp that line is. That's not allowing a lot of bleed from the image. So now, just for the sake of the process, I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna crank the hardness down a little bit and I'm gonna tap my brush over here once. So I'm just gonna tap it once. Now watch when I zoom in. 
Do you see how much checkerboard is bleeding through there versus up here? It's allowing more blending, which we call feathering of an image by doing that. Watch what happens when I crank the brush up. So I'm gonna make it like 2,800 just because you're gonna see. Now watch if I'm off the page and just barely on the page and tap my mouse. Did you see it erased even part of the pixels all the way over here? Even over here into here because I made a really big brush with not a very hard edge. Now, where that comes into play. If I'm doing a photo for a, a fashion magazine and I have a model with very flowy hair and the hair has adjustments of colors, the tips are blue, the top of the hair might be a purple color, but it's an actual blonde with the hair being blonde, but the tips are different colors. They did color overlays of each change of the color and they use what's called a feathering technique or they removed the area of the picture where they didn't want that color in the photo. So in essence, the only color on the pink layer of the model's photo is the pixels where the pink is. Everything else was erased. Where the blue tips in the hair is the layer of the model called blue tips, where the only area of the image that was on that layer was the blue tips. Everything else was erased. So just keep in mind that that's a process of stacking overlays on top of each other where they feather in and erase the areas that they don't want. So you're gonna notice right here, I only want the high contrast overlay to be where the mountain is, not in the sky. So watch when I just tap my mouse. And I'm just gonna tap it right around the edge of the mountain, just so that you can see, watch what happens when I turn on black and white overlay, but I keep the RGB. Look at the high contrast, it's only the mountains. It's as if the, the mountains was only blasted with light and the sky was the muted color before. This happens so much in advertising that you don't even realize it. No picture is a raw image. Every picture has an image overlay of some kind. So there you go. So there's the first overlay. So let's take this and let's duplicate this layer again. So we're gonna call it RGB copy. So now we have the original image, the black and white, and we have the RGB copy. So for the sake of the process, I'm gonna hide the black and white and I'm gonna apply a new technique to the copy. The new technique to the copy I'm gonna make, I'm gonna do color burn. So now, so let's see what we have going on here. So there is our, black and white, and here is our RGB. So I'm gonna hide the black and white and I'm gonna rename this one Mountains Burn, Mountains Burn. Are we okay? Do we have a black and white layer, a Mountains Burn layer, and an RGB layer? So look at the difference between regular RGB and burn and regular RGB and overlay, just so that you see what's going on here. So I'm gonna hide the black and white and I'm only gonna turn on the burn. Now, I've decided that I wanna burn in only the bottom of the mountain. So you see this little area right here, this is the bottom of the mountain. I'm gonna take away the top of the image. So I'm just gonna erase the top of the image. And you can do that with any size brush. So we're just gonna take it away. And I like to follow the path of the mountain. So if it's got a slant of some kind, I like to kind of follow the slant just so that you can see what's going on. So look what now is happening, right? 
RGB and fern. Well, that would be interesting all by itself, right? This is kind of a weird thing we have going on here. So we have the original RGB, we now have a burn layer, and we have a black and white overlay layer on top of that. Now, are we okay? So we're just kind of erasing and playing around here a little bit. I just want to show you what stacking layers, stacking effects, stacking an understanding of how Photoshop works in this kind of circumference circle brush environment so you can see, but we're doing all this in one mode, the original RGB mode, right? So anything we did, we did black and white as a new image, duplicated the layer over, even though that was black and white, it was black and white in an RGB mode. So we stripped the color out as its own object, but we brought it into an RGB mode, which means black and white can exist in RGB, right? Just because the image layer is, RG, is black and white, it's still existing in an RGB world. We just made the color range only grayscales, right? But if we were in black and white world and we tried to duplicate RGB into it, there's no color separation in black and white. So that's where the difference is. So when I wanna strip color out, I do it in a new document and bring it into the final color mode the color mode that I want. Okay, so, so let's just take a look at this. So watch what happens as I just change the order of these two things. So you see how this burn, so look how deep it is. See how deep it is underneath there? Why is it that deep underneath there? because the overlay of black and white is affecting that burn, right? But look what happens if I move it on top of it. See how it became its own entity? Remember, these are pieces of paper stacking on top of it. So the layer styles only affect the layers underneath, not the layers on top of. So if I want original pixel density on top of overlay density, then I, they have to be stacked on top of each other. The minute I move this down, overlay is affecting this image. Once I move it on top, it's only affecting the RGB original layer. So watch what happens if I turn that off, right? Look at the difference. This overlay is affecting this RGB, but this one is not being affected by the overlay. So there's a million different things you can do just playing with layer images affecting the different effects, the layer effects of each of the copies. So they're right on top of each other. They just have a different technique. So let's look at that one more time. So let's go to RGB. And let's duplicate that layer again, RGB copy. Now, for this one, I'm going to make only the tip of the mountain. So you see this little tip right here? Only the tip of the mountain. And I want that tip of the mountain to be look, look like, oh, like something is just highlighting the tip of that mountain. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna move it to the top. So you see how I'm just clicking and dragging this because I don't want the burn or the black and white overlay to affect this layer. So I'm gonna move it right up to the top. So there it is right there, right? It's right at the top. So why can't I see any of the other layer effects? because it's sitting on top, right? It's sitting on top, it's a normal image and it has no opacity adjustments. Watch if I adjust the opacity of this layer. I can start seeing what I did underneath and look how drastic it is. Watch if I slide it up. Oh, it makes it very subtle now. So look what's happening. Original on the top, original on the bottom. Original on the top is 43% opacity in essence, 50% light shining through it. 
but all the effects are sandwiched in between. So you know what this does? This mutes out the effects, but it allows them to partially show through. This is a really, because watch what happens when I turn this one off. Look how drastic it is. Look when I turn it back on. Oh, it's much more subtle now. These are the nuances of pulling out image details that you see every single day in advertising. You have an original copy on the bottom, an original copy on top that has a little opacity change so you can see through it. So imagine top piece of bread, bottom piece of bread. Bottom piece of bread is toasted, nice and hard. Top piece of bread, dunk in a little bit of water so it gets a little sloppy. A little, and then the PB and J or the ham and cheese or whatever kind of sandwich you like, those things in the middle are the layer effects that were applied to the image that were sandwiched between the two pieces of bread. So as long as you have a copy of the image with a light opacity, you can see everything in between it. But I don't want to do that. So I'm going to crack this back up to 100%. Because what I want to do is I want to highlight the tip of the top of this mountain as being like, oh, like sun shining down just direct, directly on the tip of the mountain. So let's see what that looks like. So let's just crank through some of our different saturations right soft light hard light vivid light i think so let me just see what i'm thinking will look the best i can crank through all of these there's some really nice ones here these down here adjust more just the overall saturation of the image they're not as drastic so i want to go kind of back up to the little bit more drastic i think i'm going to go with i think i'm going to go with hard light so I'm going to do hard light just so that you can see the difference. So look when I click and turn the hard light off and on, right? You can really see what's going on here, right? Now, in order for me to only have the top of the mountain be hard light, I have to erase everything on the hard light layer except for the little tip of the top of the mountain. So watch what happens when I take my brush down here. I'm just gonna start erasing, 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 erasing. But I'm going to just erase and cup. So you see I'm doing this cupping technique. I'm just gonna cup the top of the mountain. So look what I'm doing. I'm just erasing everything else. So now watch what happens if I turn off all the other layers. So you see what it looks like? That's what the layer looks like on the top. I've erased everything, but the very, very little top of the mountain, right? So now I'm gonna start turning the other layers back on. Look, the burn is only the bottom of the mountain, right? The black and white is only this part of the mountain. So you see what I'm doing? I'm just highlighting the areas of the image. So now when I turn the original back on, Hmm, very interesting, right? So now if I turn that off, can you see it's only highlighting the tip of that mountain? You will never look at photos and advertising again because this is exactly what every designer does. They just enhance the areas of the image in order to create this surreal, dreamy environment. That's all they're doing, but look at this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually going to rename this one just so that we know that this top layer is hard light. Or sometimes I'll name it mountain tip or something just so I know what it is. So look at what the original image looked like. It was okay, right? It's okay. And we enhance that. Then we enhance this. Then we enhance this. And now we have a really funky, surreal, over-enhanced image. I did a poster probably about 10 years ago, Charleston, South Carolina. Every year they do Pirate Fest and they were looking for a poster to design. I knew someone there in PR, they kind of do the PR for the city. So they're like, hey, we need a Pirate Fest. We're doing a poster for the event. Do you want to do it? And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to do that, right? Um, and I created this thing and it was a pirate face 
and I took an old pirate ship and I put the face of the model on the end of the ship, kind of give that carved effect. I had over a hundred layers just for the pirate's face in order to create this like really artificial wood carved. It was an actual person. It ended up being wood carved looking in the end. I had over a hundred layers just for the pirate's face. The actual poster had like 300 layers. But I'll tell you, no one had any idea what was created out of that. They just saw a really cool image in the end. But I started with one picture of a boat and one picture of a pirate and 300 layers later, I had like a really artificial looking wooden pirate ship with a wooden pirate face carved into the front of the ship. And it was done exactly like this. It would start with two images, one RGB of the pirate ship, one RGB of the pirate and together created a really artificial surreal thing. All the way down to, I changed the crackle technique on the patch of the eye of the pirate to not only give it three dimensional properties, a little bit of a bevel and emboss, a little bit of a texture pattern overlay on top of the patch. And then I put the South Carolina flag on top of the pouch, but I not only did the flag, but I highlighted the sun separate from the palm tree, which is what South Carolina's flag is, the palm tree and sun. And so this technique, as simple as it is in four layers, can be a hundred layers with different effects applied to each one and each one feathered or blended into the image to create this thing of surreal space. All right. Did you get yours to? I don't flatten them till the end. And remember, keep the PSD file and then the flattened JPEG or PNG you will put in it. And then no one will ever know because it looks like one layer and it's just, it is what it is, but yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the black and white too with the, I got like a little cap or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, you got the idea. Yeah, so, okay, so that covers in your book this basic concept here of layers, stacking layers, feathering layers and adjusting layer properties, which is what this is over here. Now, we could take that another step further and start looking at what is embedded in each layer. So now we have the understanding of color mode. We have the understanding of layer stack. We have the understanding of image feathering, and we have the understanding of layer properties, which is what this little thing is up here. Now, there's two other areas in Photoshop that you can adjust, manipulate properties of a layer. One is inside of the layer itself, which is called layer styles, which your book very much addresses with bevels and textures and all of those different things. Now, Inside of layer styles, you're gonna notice some more detailed properties. First, as it applies to the layer blend, which is what this little layer property is up here. So you'll notice this layer, we chose hard light and we chose opacity of 100, which you can see right here. And you can see the fill is 100, which is right here. But what you can't see is that hard light has this default setting of its blend mode right here. You can change that hard light and change the blend mode of it. So I'm going to switch it to green and click OK. And now this thing has an adjusted color blend of hard light to have a green hue instead. Of, and it's very subtle. Keep in mind, because this is a filter of hard light, I meaning it's, it's like a pin drop of light shining on this. The default is gray, but you can change that blend mode. And you can also do some other adjustments here. In basic advertising design class, I want you to understand 
the blending options and the layer styles. But there are just uh, my buddy and his Photoshop effects he puts in his photos for real estate are ridiculous. He presets all of these in settings and he does a couple of clicks and it flushes everyone with a certain layer overlay, a certain blend mode and all of these adjustments together. It's really crazy. And he even does individual channels knowing that an image is separated into RGB, which your book actually shows you with the tennis player. It shows you the RGB channel, the red, the green, and the blue, which are in here. RGB is actually red, green, and blue. And it has a separation digitally into its channels. And your tennis player, they actually have you turn off one of the channels in order to create more of a green blue than a red, green and blue. Because if you remove that color from the color separation, then it's as if the dripping of the paint in the can that stirs for the color in your house just removes red. So if you only drip green and blue, you're going to get a totally different color, right? So even in Photoshop, that is separated. So let's play around a little bit inside the layer style. So we'll just double click on it and we're in the hard light layer. So just remember, that's only kind of the top of the mountain. So if we make any adjustments, it's only going to happen to the top of the mountain. So if we pick a bevel, it's going to try to make an attempt to bevel. And you do that in your text. Your actually text process gives it contour in your text block for bevel and embossing. It's best used for text. It's not really a great technique for images because it does a faux 3D, but when you take a two-dimensional image that's flat and try to do a faux 3D, it doesn't really do a great job of it. So I kind of avoid beveling inside images because 2D isn't made for 3D unless you make a 3D shape and you apply the image to a particular edge. So let's turn that off. And I'm just gonna turn on stroke for a minute just so you can see what happens in stroke world. Like look what happens. It actually can see where I feather erased. If you get a bunch of lines that are like looking like this all over your image, it means you didn't erase it very well. Because if you get all these swipes, it's trying to add a stroke around all the areas that you tried to erase. So you see if I crank that up, it's eating into the image. The nice part about stroke is that if you have an image that you do a clip of, a clipping mask of, you can add a white stroke around it and it makes a frame around it. So if you had an image that you cut a square out of and you went into layer styles and add a little stroke to it, uh, you would get a border around it. That's how you put a border around an image. Uh, so stroke comes in handy in image blending. I'm gonna turn, turn that one off. Let's go to inner shadow. Now, inner shadow is exactly what it sounds like. I'm actually gonna go to a layer that I have more of the image exposed because I'm only using this tiny little tip up here and it makes it hard sometimes to see some of the effects. So I'm gonna go to the bigger meteor layer, which is the mountain burn, which is the bottom of this image down here. That's the mountain burn, that piece right there and a little bit of the top of the image because you'll be able to see some of these things a little bit easier. So it is very contrasty because it has a burn to it. But inner shadow, and I'm actually gonna switch this to normal so you can actually really see it. You see this thing that's happening at the top of this in white, it's trying to put a shadow inside of the edge of that layer. And keep in mind that the edge of the layer is the tip of the triangular of the mountain. Right, So it's trying to put an inner shadow in just that angle that erased of that image because the burn is only down here. So if I make it black, you're going to see the halo technique, right? You're going to see it right now. So if I turn that off and turn it back on, you're going to see this thing right here that's happening. It's doing the inner shadow. It's a really great way to add additional depth to any of the layers that you erase a little bit. And students can spend hours playing around with these layer styles, just seeing like what happens when they do a certain thing. So watch me just crank this up a little bit just to give it a little bit of extra depth. And I'm gonna crank it up just a little bit. And now you can really see what is happening with the inner shadow that I've applied 
to just the mountain fern, the bottom piece. It's giving it, in essence, a bleeded stroke inside the edge of this thing, an inner shadow. So think about cutting a square out of a piece of paper and putting that piece of paper on top of a photo. The shadow that's created inside the edge of that square is an inner shadow. Same thing if I cut a square out of a piece of paper and lay it on top of a photo and I shine light into it, which is what an inner glow is. Shadow adds darkness to the inner edge. A glow adds light to the inner edge. So if we do that, you can immediately see the white angle that's happening here. That's called an inner shadow or an inner glow. Now, if you choose normal for that, it's going to not allow any of the image to blend through there. It's gonna make it a much harder kind of glow to it. So if I crank up the opacity, you can see it adds an actual stripe to it. You see this all the time in like faked photos, like, oh my gosh, look at that neon effect. The only difference for the neon effect is that. And you see this on the posters all the time for musicians where they have some kind of glow applied across their face or in an image. All that is, is an inner glow in a green toxic or purple toxic or whatever with a very hard opacity. So watch as I lighten it, right? I could submit this picture to uh, the History Channel and tell them I saw an alien ship fly across, right? You could see that neon, but look how funky that is. I mean, you can make some really interesting things by doing image stacking, which is what this is, and layer effects on the image stack. And if you feather the image like we did, you can do some really funky things. So I'm gonna turn off the inner glow. I'm gonna add satin. Satin is as if you printed the image on shiny paper. So imagine how that would work. If you had a piece of satin and you tried to screen print a picture on the satin, you're gonna get a dark, not fully saturated image because ink doesn't take to satin very well. In essence, that's what this does. It tries to add color to something that's shiny and it actually does the opposite. It mutes it down. But if you don't let light go through it and you make it normal, you can get a little bit more play from it. So watch if I crank it to white and I do normal. See that? That's the effect of trying to print color on something that's really shiny. You get this kind of washed out um, Xerox copy kind of thing. This works really well when you want to make something old fashioned. Like if you're creating an image and you want it to feel like it's been there a really long time, do a satin overlay in normal and put white on it and it'll immediately wash it out. So imagine if you did an old West image and the entire background had a satin overlay in normal with white wash on it, but you burned in the cowboy onto it in a high saturation area, then it would look like the image was retouched from the old original image to bring out the character of the new image. Boy, you can get some really cool things. You see it all the time with HBO and movie motion picture companies trying to make something shot in the olden days look really new. And that's what they're doing. They're doing a satin overlay of the image and doing a high contrast burn of the elements that they want to look high definition and new. And that's how you get 1882 or whatever the show was they filmed. Take a look at some of their marketing pieces. They have a satin overlay of background elements and they have color burns of foreground elements. And that's how you get that. But look at what it did to it. I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, it's, I mean, it makes a totally different interpretation. And watch if I just crank the opacity down. Like again, it's, it's a stylistic thing, right? It's a stylistic thing. But there's a place for softening that area. I would soften that area if I needed to put the actors' names down there. I can't do it in this like super burned out area. I need to soften it a little bit. So these styles are really good for controlling where you want to put stuff. And remember, if you're stacking layers, you can always, if you're making a design and you decide I need to put text in this area and it's too bright in this one area, 
you can duplicate the layer, apply a layer style to the duplicated layer and put a wash over it. And then you're only tinting down the area of the image you want the text to be put on. Every student defaults to a shadow or glow in order for you to see the text on a picture. But that's not necessarily the only way to do it. The way to do it is to mute an area of the image to put the text on top of it. That's the professional way to do it. Adding an outer glow or shadow just to separate it doesn't necessarily make it the best way. And keeping in mind, not all design in Photoshop world needs to look like it has 3D stacks on top of it. And that's what shadows do. They add three-dimensional space to a two-dimensional plane. Kind of think of it as like cut paper. If you cut a bunch of images and tape them together, and then you put stickers of letters on top of it, the letters are sitting on top of the photos physically, which means there's a shadow created around the letter because it's stuck on top of the photo. You can tell the difference between a composition physically made up versus something created in Photoshop. But there's a place for that too. Lots of designers I know that are artistic, a little bit more of the tactile designer, create things by hand and they create their own three dimension using cut out letters and cut out pictures and things like that. So just trying to expose you to different techniques so you can see what things are happening in Photoshop when you're doing different steps. Okay, so that brings us to, and I'm gonna turn off satin. I'm just trying to show you different things. Now, you wanna create a silhouette? Any object layer that you have, well, that made that very interesting. Um, any object layer that you have over here, and by object layer, I mean, if you had a layer where you just cut out uh, a person or you just cut out a butterfly or an animal or anything like that, you can immediately make them a silhouette by just doing a color overlay and making it black, right? You can see it right there. It makes a perfect triangular black. This is a really good technique for iTunes gift cards. Remember when iTunes gift card had that campaign where it was dancing silhouettes? And the cards and everything were the people with the uh, uh, AirPods with the things in their ears, and they were just purple or black or uh, any color. And it was just on the gift card. It was in the commercials. You know what they did? They actually shot the people dancing on a green screen. So the background was separate from the person. And then in Premiere, they did an effect, which is the same effects you have in Photoshop, just in a kinetic world. And they did a color overlay. So the film was a dancing person with an overlay on top of every frame of that film of a solid color. And so now they have dancing solid color and they can do a export of one frame of the film of the dancing character. And that one frame export becomes a JPEG, a PNG, a TIFF, and they use that for the physical cards they printed. It was easy as a green screen filming a person dancing with an iPod with the ear pods. Remember, because the overlay only overlays the pixels that exist. So if it's a green screen, that's transparent. So the character was dancing by itself in the frame. And Premiere, you can do a color overlay, just like you can do in Photoshop. So they just overlay the color <coughs> over the character. And the character danced in whatever color they filled it in. It's really genius, right? versus a frame by frame, two dimensional color overlay. I mean, that's, that would take you a long time, but I don't know if you were little and you used to take a pad of paper and you would draw a little stick figure and then move the arm and then move the leg and then move the head. And then you would flick the little book and the little character would dance. In essence, that's what the color overlay is. It's one piece of paper at a time with a color flushed over it. But if you know the term color overlay, in Photoshop, that's a really important term because that's the term that Adobe uses for every silhouette technique that it uses. It's called a color overlay. And just the same as a color overlay is a gradient overlay, which is what this is. Now, gradient overlays, if you know what the gradient tool is, 
or what a gradient is, it means it's taking it from one color to another, blending from one color to another, which is a really cool technique they use on t-shirts that my 13 year old has fallen in love with where it blends one color into the next. And, uh, and that's what Photoshop does, it's called a gradient. Now you're gonna notice that the gradient tool, and I'm gonna crank it up to hundred so you can see it, allows you to blend one color to the next. So look at the basic overlays, black and white, black to transparent, gray to white. But look what happens when you start going down to some of these funkier ones. Like I'm gonna go down to neutrals and I'm gonna pick this blend. So it's like a, a earth tony color, like sandstone to kind of a purple. And watch what happens when I change the opacity. So you see how it's washing it up with a color? And watch what happens if I change the application of it. Look at how subtly different that is down there. You can actually see it's taking some of the burn out of it. Still has a burn, but it's softening the bird with a neutral overlay. That's actually pretty nice because now it's not as drastic, but still gives you the burn with a slight overlay. And watch when I crank it down just a skosh. So if I go to zero, it's a complete, there's nothing. But watch as I just crank it subtly. It's hard to see on the projector, but there is a very softening of the burn. That is a style. I mean, there are designers that do hard burns on all of their images, and then they go in and do very subtle overlays in different color palettes. So you see pastels, neutrals, iridescent, clouds, grays, greens, oranges. This is a technique doing a color burn with a gradient overlay to change the shift of the color burn. Color burns are by nature white. They're burning out part of the image with white, but you can do a gradient overlay and adjust what the burn color is, make it a neutral, make it a purple, make it a pink, make it a blue, and you get this technique. So this is a style that some designers use for all of their ads. They do a color burn of the foreground areas, the, the areas of the image they want people to look at, and then they go in and do a layer style overlay gradient because you want the gradient to be subtle transition. That's the difference between color overlay. Gradient overlay lets you actually shift the color shift here as a linear one color to the next in a straight line versus a radial, which is a circle, an angle, deflected or reflected, and diamond, right? So there's different ways to do that. Most people understand linear. So when you see the really beautiful water in the Caribbean that goes from one color to the other, that's a linear transition. If you see a spot in the water that's glowing out from one color to the other, darker in the center, lighter on the edge, that's a radial. So you'll see that when they're shooting from above and they wanna make it look like it's cavernous or there's some really beautiful darkness in the center of the image, they'll do a gradient overlay in blues and do it as a radial and that means that it's darker in the center, lighter on the outside, and you can get some, you get more depth in a two-dimensional photo to make it feel more like three-dimensional space if you do a gradient overlay. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be your travel poster? <laughs> yeah, so all just, and you can adjust and play. It'll be a good time in your travel poster to do some image stacking and blending some pictures together and see what you come up with. And you can practice and try all of these little different overlays. Now, keep in mind that if I do a gradient overlay and I pick color overlay, it overrides gradient overlay because it's they're trying to do both things at once. If you are wanting to do more than one layer style on an image, I would recommend duplicating the layer and applying one style to each layer. Because if you don't do that, 
and you do it all in one image layer, they will compare. heads and it's going to uh, it's basically the glow oh that's nice uh the glow is going to compete with the shadow so the glow is going to become darker because the shadow darkness is going to overpower the glow so just keep that in mind and when i said 100 layers just to do the pirate face it's because i had multiple styles applied to the same image layer so let's say I had 10 color burn layers of the same area of the image, but each color burn layer had its own layer style. Now, if I have five burn layers with five different layer styles and each one has a soft opacity, which means it isn't 100%, which means it's really sharp and you can't see anything through it, if it's 50% or 40% or 30%, remember, if it's 30%, 70% of the layer underneath of it is showing through. So if I even did the same technique to the same layer and made a copy of it, it would actually double the intensity of that effect in the image. So watch what happens. So if I say, okay, to this mountain burn. So you see it, it's right here. It's that, and it's the little bit of the top of the sky, right? This little halo effect right here. Watch what happens if I make a copy of this layer and put it right on top. It doubled the burn intensity and gradient overlay. Well, that seems redundant, right? Because now I can't see the beauty of the burn because it's over the top, right? It's too much, too much of this burn that's happening here, right? But watch what happens if I lower the opacity. So let's say uh, 15%. I don't know if you could see it on the projector, but it does adjust it. Yeah, I have OCD, type A personality, but part of those hundred layers were the same layers on top of each other with slightly different fills and opacities to adjust the saturation of that particular effect. So just imagine the sun and the palm tree on the patch of the pirate, and there were five layers of just the sun in burn. And I adjusted the opacity of each of the layer styles on that patch to get kind of a funky glow going on. Would anyone but me know it? Probably not. But will everyone think it looks pretty neat? Yeah. So that's the trick is, you know, how much of that surreal, super enhanced environment can we make using this idea of layer upon layer, feathered image upon feathered image with a layer filter and a layer style applied to it to create something that started like this and ended like this. I mean, two totally different images. I mean, look at the mountain tip and the canyon here and the the overall color separation of this thing compared to the original image. And we did it one, two, three, four, five total images or four layer stacks and an original image. Okay, the last part of image stacking and image adjusting has to do with some of our areas up here. Filter effects are a really critical part of image stacking. So I don't know if you saw the commercials on some of the Apple iPhone commercials and stuff, but now they have this cinematic filter that allows you to move the focal point 
based on the person talking in the video that you're shooting on your phone. I do a lot of controlled blurring of images in order to create focal points. So that's the last part of this process that I wanna show you. And then we're gonna cover our text fills and our uh, clipping masks. So we got about 45 minutes or so, so we'll cover those last two things, but this is the last part of kind of the image layer adjusting I wanna show you. So in order to do this, let's take a copy of the original, right? I'm gonna do another top piece of bread. So we've got this stuff we got going on here. So I, you know, you can drag and right over the plus symbol and it will give you a copy or you can right click on it and do duplicate copy. So you can do it that way or you can drag the little layer down to the plus. Just be careful you don't drag it to the trash can because it'll go bye-bye. So if you're not comfortable with that, do the right click. All right, so now I'm gonna move this to the top. So let's take this thing and move it to the top. Oh my gosh, I just lost all of the beautiful things I did because my top piece of bread and my bottom piece of bread are the original image and there's no light shining through. So it's like taking two photographs that were printed on glossy paper and putting on top of each other and putting really cool images that were printed on plastic in between and you can't see them because the top piece, well watch what happens if I change the opacity. I can start seeing what I did underneath. So, but we're not gonna do that because I wanna show you controlled blur. Okay, so let's keep that back to 100%, right? So there it is, right? But I've decided I want these images of the clouds up here really blurred. Now, you'll notice from the layers in between the top and bottom piece of bread, I didn't leave any pixels from the sky. So if you notice the hard light is only the tip of the mountain. The burn is only the valley of the mountain. The burn copy, valley. Black and white, only the mountain range. If you actually look, there's a checkerboard at the top piece of the image on any of the effects. The only one that has pixels is the original image in the sky. And I did that on purpose. The reason I did that is because I'm gonna blur out the clouds and that is going to have no bleed through. Like you're not gonna be able to see the pixels underneath. So I, I'm controlling the focal point by only having the layers that have an effect be not in the area I wanna blur out. I have, I've only applied it to the focal point, which is the mountain range. So I'm gonna go now and I'm going to go up to filter. And so filters are ways to, if you ever used a camera, there's actually filters for cameras that you screw onto the lens and you can change what's happening with the camera when you take the picture. That's what a filter is. For Photoshop, they just built these effects, these things you can apply to the entire layer that is permanent, permanent. The things you apply inside the layers as layer effects are not permanent. I can always go back in to any of these and uncheck whatever technique I had used. And if I wanted to go from hard light back to normal, I can change that. I only temporarily adjusted the pixels in that particular layer. These are permanent. When I go in and start adjusting pixels this way, I'm actually adjusting the pixels. I'm making a morphing of them. I'm modifying them. I'm changing them. Kind of like in graphic design one, when I was like, if you use the paintbrush and paint over this picture, you've removed the pixels on the picture where you painted it. Kind of the same technique. But I use this a lot for distortion and blur. So in this case, I want to blur the clouds only on this layer, right? In Photoshop, we're only manipulating the layer that we're on. So if we do an effect of any kind, we're adjusting it to that layer. That's the beauty about the black and white mountains, the color burn mountains, the hard light mountains. It's only happening to the layer. And when we erase or feather the layer, it only affects the pixels on that layer that still exist. That's why we're removing part of it. All right, so let's go to motion blur. And everyone does this and they're like, oh my God, you're gonna make me have motion sickness, right? Let's go to motion blur, motion blur. And I'm going to crank up the blur. 
And so look at what's happening to this picture. It's as if I had had a couple of cocktails. I'm standing on the edge of a helicopter. I'm taking a photo of this thing and the world is shaking to an end. And look at the angle. I can actually change the angle of this thing too. So I wanna move the angle of this thing so it's going down a little bit because I want this to feel like it's dripping at the top. Like it's kind of dripping down. Like as if you printed this thing, it was still wet. You tacked it up on the board and the ink started running down the page. I also did a really drastic one at 200 pixels because if I crank it down, it's a lot harder for you to see what is going on when I don't shake the pixels that much. So let's move it up to about, uh, let's go roughly to about the 100, 100 range, just so you can see the 100 range of this image. Now, this is cinematic focus is what Apple uses it for the iPhone. They have this new cinematic process where you can shoot 4K video and it only is sharp in the person talking and everyone around the image goes into a soft blur. And then as the camera moves to the next person talking, the spot of the focus goes only to that person and blurs the other person out, which is cool because the person in the background can actually be the sharp person. Person in the foreground can be the blurred person. Very cool. This is the same technique. We're just doing it in static world. We're just doing it in Photoshop world. Now, we don't have to do motion blur. We could have done one of the other blurs here under filters that we could have just blurred it a little bit. We could do a little angular blur. We could do a little lens blur as if it was the lens was foggy when we took the picture. We can do what's called a shape or smart blur where it finds the area of the image that is most dominant and tries to blur that. And there's actually a sharpening technique for that too, where you can actually have it picked the primary part of the image and tries to make it sharper for you, which is a technique we do use sometimes. So we're gonna stick with just the regular old motion blur. So you can see it right here it is but I only want the clouds to be blurry. So I'm gonna go back to my brush, my eraser, and I'm going to erase. So watch, I'm just clicking my mouse and following it along the clouds, the edge of the mesa. And so I'm gonna erase all of that. So the only thing that's left, so look at this. Why is this important? It's important because in marketing, in advertising, in visual messaging, there's always an area of the image that you want to put something that isn't in, as important to the primary image, the focal point of the image that you might want to put text, you might want to put a logo, you might want to put another image, maybe cut out in a circle, you want to soften the area of the images that aren't the focal points of your image so that you can let the other elements really sing, like really become important. <clears throat> so this is a really easy technique or easy way to do it. Say that again. Besides that, well, satin, satin will highlight it. So blur will remove the focal point. So satin, hard light, uh, gradient overlay, like any of those techniques, they're for highlighting the focal point. Filter effects like blurring and softening of the image is to make the background set in, to like disappear, to not become important. So now you can see, that those clouds, even though they were sharp, are now no longer the focal area of the image. And although it's subtle, you can really see it in the image that we now have given this area a place to put text. And we're actually gonna put text up there. We're gonna put a little text up there so you can see <clears throat> why we would do that. Because this is gonna be kind of the, 
mock-up for our travel poster. I'm gonna put a little text up here. I gotta come up with a name for this thing. It looks like Nevada or something. So we can need to make a spin on the word Nevada. So, <clears throat> so now we've created all of these stacked layers for focal and we've put the top piece of bread as softening, something to make the background truly disappear into the background. All right, so now we've taken a look at layers. We've taken a look at your color mode of your layer. We've taken a look at your layer styles, right? So you have normal and multiply and color burn and, uh, and those are all right here. We took a look at the idea of feathering a layer, which means removing elements from that layer in order to highlight the other layers. We took a look at the layer effects, which are what are inside of the layers when you double click on them in order to get access to these details like satin to make something shiny or brighter, shadows or glows to either brighten or darken things, the gradient overlay, which gave us that nice little transition of color from one color to the other, subtly placed back in it. We looked at opacity, which means the amount of light shining through the layer, which means that if it's 100%, there's no light shining through the layer. If it's 0%, there's no color to the layer. It's all shining through. And then any range between zero and 100% in order to create this technique. Now, that brings us to adding elements like a clipping mask, and or textual elements. So the first thing we're gonna do is deal with textual elements. Using the text tool inside of uh, uh, advertising design, a, a poster or an image or something you're making where you wanna add text and you actually wanna add some depth to the text as well, which is what your book does. So we need to start by getting our second image. So we've done all of this just with one image. So let's go back to Pexels. And I think we need, like a sand image. So let's type in sand texture to see what we get. And so it's kind of deserty. So I think we need sand. Wow, there's some really funky sand images here. Look at this one right here, which is kind of crackly and everything. I actually think uh, maybe that's a little too drastic for what we're doing. Let's see what we have here. I'm just gonna scroll down for a little bit just to see the different techniques. Oh man, there are some beautiful ones. Look at this one. This is like the desert. I really dig this one. So uh, let's download this one. And you can pick any one you want. Now I'm gonna drag this image over and I'm gonna put it in my add design folder. Remember, we wanna keep all the things in the same spot. So the add design folder. And that's all I'm gonna need for images. So I'm gonna go ahead and just close my pexels. Now, remember, the first thing we have to do is we have to open up this image. So let's either drag that new textured image down to the Photoshop icon, or you can do file open and grab that image. So I want you to get the texture and I want you to open up that image inside of Photoshop. Now, remember, We have our other layers still here, right? They're tabs. And I can actually close the grayscale one because I don't need that one. So you should have a tab that is your texture in Photoshop, which means it's open, and a tab that is your image blend, which is this one. So we have two files open in Photoshop, sand texture and our image blend. Are we okay? 
we're able to download a sand texture. And then just open it up in Photoshop. So we have that sand image opened in Photoshop. All right. So now we have the sand image and we have our original image blend thing we have going on here. Now, we need to get this layer over to here. The first thing I like to do is unlock the standard image, just like we did for the black and white. I wanna unlock this thing so I have access to all the pixels. So I'm gonna double click on that and I'm just gonna name it sand texture. And I'm gonna click okay. All right, so now we have this thing. We named it, it's its own thing. We got its own layer here and we need to duplicate it and bring it over here, right? So I'm gonna right click on this and I'm gonna duplicate the layer and I'm gonna make it sand texture. It doesn't have to be a copy because I'm moving it over here to my image blended document. So I'm just picking to open it inside of the image that I'm playing around with. And I'm gonna click okay. And then you're gonna see that my sand layer now is over here in my image document that I was doing with my image collage. So here it is right here. So I opened it, I unlocked it and I duplicated it. But when I pick duplicate, I duplicated it to the document I had already been building. So this would be named like travelposter.psd if I had named it as I've started to build my image. So just for the sake of seeing it, I'm gonna go ahead and name this, right? Just so that you can see. So I'm gonna name it Travel Poster. So now when I duplicate my sand layer, you're gonna see that I'm actually duplicating it to my travel poster, my travel poster, not to a new document or this document that already exists. So all I did was do file save as and named my little image I've been playing around with as travel poster. So you can open up, so I'll trash this for a second. So the image that you have blended during our lecture, just do file save as and just name it travel poster and put it in the same place that you have the images we've been playing around with. So that'll make it easier to see we probably should have named that as we were playing around, not built the entire thing before we actually saved it. Are we okay? So we have travel poster. And now that we unlocked our sand texture, I'm just gonna do duplicate layer and I'm gonna duplicate it to the travel poster. So now when I look at the travel poster, I have this image. Now, depending on which layer you had selected, it might appear down here. So we have to click and drag it so it goes up to the top because we want it to be on the very top of the image. Here it is right here, right? I can use my move tool and I can move it around. More than likely, it doesn't fill the whole size because I downloaded a really high quality image. But that's actually gonna work out on our benefit because when I show you what it looks like when we texturize the image or texturize the text, you'll see that it's limited to the size of the image that I brought in. Now, what I like to do when I'm bringing in textures, so I bring in textures as layers after I've kind of composed what I'm doing. The very first thing I like to do is I like to make each texture a pattern, make each texture a pattern. And you do that by opening up the pattern palette. So you see that under the window drop down, there's a thing called patterns, which is right here. And actually there are patterns that already exist inside of default patterns. So there's like tree patterns and grass, and there's actually, and there's water, and there's actually other patterns you can download from the internet that are Photoshop patterns. And they actually are free ones out there that designers create and they throw out there. But 
the thing I like to do is I like to import textures and make them patterns. So you'll notice if I hit the little plus, it'll give me my file as a pattern. So you're gonna see it gives my file as a pattern and I'm gonna click, okay. And you're gonna notice that my image here becomes a pattern. And the reason I like to do that is because I can do a couple of things. I can texturize my image if I want to, but I can also fill all kinds of shapes with patterns, which I'll do with text, I'll do with silhouettes, I'll do with different objects I bring into my design. So I'm gonna go ahead and minimize my patterns. Now, if I was doing this, I would actually make my pattern fill the page. So if I grab this thing, and I just make it as big as my image. So you see this right here. Is it good to scale something up? In Photoshop, it's not a good idea to scale something up because it softens the pixels, but I'm actually using it as a texture. So I'm not gonna use it as 100% opacity anyway. I'm gonna do some kind of funky texture application so I can actually make it a little bit bigger. So I made it bigger. So that fills the whole page and I'm just going to apply that. So all I did was click, click to show transform, right? That's how you make something bigger. So I just picked that layer and click the show transform and I just made it bigger. Now, just for the sake of the process, I'm going to do what we did with patterns and I'm going to do it again. So I'm going to click on the pattern. I'm going to kick, click plus. I'm going to click OK. And you're going to notice there's now two patterns, right? I have two patterns inside of my pattern palette. Right, so you see this little pattern fill icon that appeared? I'm gonna go ahead and hide that. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is pick the texture as a full layer, and I'm gonna do what your book does, and that's called overlay. So look what happens when I overlay my image. That is texture over all of the images that I stacked. Look at the technique that happens here. Oh my gosh, that's like super funky because I picked a really wavy sand texture. Your book does crackle. So it does like a crackly effect and they do it over a tennis player. Same thing, I just doing sand texture over. So look at the difference in the image, like holy crow. And I'm gonna change the opacity by cranking it down a little bit, just so you can see the difference. Like, look at this thing. It's like super funky now. Yeah, so now do you have your pattern palette open? Yeah. I what I did was I double clicked on my image and it did an overlay, but I actually did it. And so I just hit mine because when I was in my duplicate of my thing, I double clicked on it. So I'll actually trash that just so that it doesn't oh, awesome. get, get a little, this one right here, this pattern fill just, I double clicked on it. So it added that little thing. So here it is just as a regular overlay. So you see what's happening here? So now, is it? Let me see. Let's see what you got. We can always take a look. Oh, yeah. Okay, all right, fine. So click on that, turn it on, and then let's go up to overlay, which is just normal. Just normal to overlay. There it is. Ooh. So let's click on that, overlay. All right, so now I'm just the eyeball rolling off the screen again. All right, so now go ahead and change your opacity. But yours is a little more image than it is texture. So look at it. I like it a little bit more. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. All right. Good. So now your book does.
does it with a tennis player. It just adds a crackle effect. Same concept. You put the layer over top. You make it an overlay. You change the opacity of it. And remember, it's an overlay with opacity. If we wanted to, we could go in here and play around with, you know, a gradient. So look at this. Right? I could go in and I could, if it was too dark, we could do a light a light overlay, like, like white, right? So there are ways to adjust it if you weren't happy with the lightness or darkness of it. Once it's an overlay, you can then apply basically poor color inside of the layer to adjust kind of the color of it. Um, okay, so that's our first one, which is our sand texture. Now, uh, we're gonna add some text, right? Just like your book does. So that's the tennis player crackle effect where you're actually just applying it as an overlay on an image, but we can also do fills and stuff with textures too. So the way I like to do it, so let's use our text tool and I'm just gonna click my text tool on the top of my image. So your text tool is right down here in your, character, in your toolbar. So let's pick the text tool and let's go, go over to our image. You got it, the old text tool. All right, we got our text tool. I'm just gonna take my text tool and I, all I'm gonna do is tap it over here in my image. So I'm not gonna click and drag or anything. I'm just gonna tap it. Now, let's zoom in. Let's make sure we get that thing. There it is. And so I'm gonna, uh, I need a name. For the sake of the process, I'm gonna write Nevada because I didn't come up with a funky name yet. So now you notice my points were really small, right? So that's why my thing is so small. So let me just trash it. So you can see that if I was to use my character palette, which is right under here, Right, and I made it like 72. Like I just made it bigger so you could actually see it. If I use my text tool now and tap it, you'll see the words are a little bit bigger. So I'm just gonna write Nevada. And I'm gonna highlight it like I do in Word. And I'm gonna go over to my character palette and I'm gonna make it like, I don't know, 300 point. I gotta make it even bigger. Let's make it 500 point. And I'm gonna make it any version of bold. So any typeface bold. All right, so here it is. And remember the text tool, if you just made, just selected the move tool and you went to the show transform controls, you can make it bigger this way too. So I can make this thing bigger just by using it like an object. So just remember text is also an object. So if I just wanted to make it bigger and I didn't want to do it by the character palette where you adjust the number here, you can use your move tool and you can adjust it there too. So here's this big old block of text here. Right, so it's got this big old block of text. Now, I like to use silhouettes. I used, like to use text. I like to use any solid shapes and apply fills to them, patterns to them. Your book does bevels, right? Does bevels, does texture, which you'll notice my pattern is also a texture. Your book chooses to do bevel, emboss, and texture, right? I did it as a pattern overlay because oftentimes 
my pattern is a replication. Like it does it a couple of times, kind of tiles it. So I, I like to do pattern overlays. Your book does texture overlays. It does the exact same thing. I just, I choose to do patterns, not textures, personally for me. So, because it keeps a cleaner repetition of the image filled inside the shape. And it also allows the embossing to be on the outside of it, which is what I like. So you can do outer bevels, you can do inner bevels, but textures for me is a final step. Like I'm doing my image blends, I'm creating this thing, the text and the texture, because the texture is a wash normally over the image. So that's the top layer, last layer, and then my elements, but watch what happens. So I have my text now with a pattern inside of it. I have this, so watch what happens if I take my sand layer and I drag it over the top. And my text is under it. Now watch if I move my text, I'm gonna lock my top layer so that I can pick this. Watch if I move it down here and I move it down. I mean, I can, I can actually tuck this thing depending on where I wanna put it. So let's lock some of these layers just so that I only have my text layer visible. So we're gonna lock these other layers just so that you can see. So now I only have access to my text layer, but look at how I can, I can get this thing to start having its own life. Like I actually would probably nestle it somewhere in the clouds so that you get a little bit of that disappearing happening inside the layer. Remember, it's like sandwich. So you're kind of stacking things on top of each other. So then I can start doing that because I've built my basic piece here. But so if I look at the difference by removing the hard light, like this really blends into the mountain now. I really like how that looks. And I have my sand here. So watch this. So here is that. So if I take this and put it under that, I can't see it at all, right? Because this has to be on top. What if I take this and drag it down a little bit? I start to get the halo effect. I mean, there's just, just a really fun way to explore the elements. But keep in mind, it all started like this. And so watch what happens when I turn it from top to bottom. So now I have that image just with sand texture, right? Original image just with sand texture, original image with sand texture and the hard light. And then I added the blurry clouds. Then I added some text. I added the mountain burn. So you can start to see what's happening. I added the second mountain burn and I added the highlight. And all of that ends up this. I'm gonna move this up towards the top and put it on top. And there it is. I'm like almost done with my travel poster. Okay, I got 15 minutes. So I got one last little nugget of design stuff. Now, your book does a clipping path around an image with shapes. And we're gonna actually just do a circle, a series of circles so you can see what the technique is that they do for the shutter image of the baseball player. They do an image on top of an image and they cut the top image out of three stripes is what they did. It's called a shutter technique where it stripes the image. It makes three shapes and puts the picture in the three shapes. So we're gonna do that with circles. 
So let's take our shape tool. So let's go down here to our shape tool, which is right down here. And I wanna use the ellipse tool. So let's use the ellipse tool. Let's pick that. And we're gonna go and let's make sure we're on the top layer. So let's click our mouse on the top layer here. Yeah, I'm actually gonna unlock some of this stuff because I want to, oh, that doesn't matter. I'm gonna need the, uh, I'm gonna need the original image because I wanna cut the original image out of the circles. So let's go ahead. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Let's lock all the layers because we're gonna merge them anyway. So let's lock all the layers, but we wanna make sure that we're on the top layer. We wanna make sure we're on the top layer. And what I wanna do is I wanna create a circle. So you're gonna notice that I have my circle tool selected and it doesn't matter what the color of the circle is because we're actually gonna put the picture inside of the circle which is what your book does. So I'm gonna take the circle tool, hold down shift, and I'm gonna draw a perfect circle. Let's just hold down shift and draw a perfect circle. And let's make it about, I don't know, about that big. So it's about a third of the page, third of the width of the page. And once we have that circle drawn, here it is right here, right? Let's make two duplicates of that layer. So let's right click on it and do duplicate layer. And that's right click on the copy and let's duplicate layer one more time. So you should have ellipse one, ellipse one copy and ellipse one copy two. So we have three of the circles. So draw one circle, right click on it, do duplicate layer. You could use the ellipse tool and just draw three circles. The only reason I did duplicate is because I want the circles to all be the exact same size. Huh. Then right click on the circle layer and do duplicate layer. Mm -hmm. So right click on your circle that you drew over on the layers palette and do duplicate layer. And so you should have ellipse one copy and then right click on the ellipse one copy layer and do duplicate layer and you should have ellipse one copy two so you end up having three circles in the exact same spot right now on the image because we haven't moved them at all so there should just be three pictures I want you to make sure that those three pictures are at the three circles are at the top of the layers. So click on each one and just drag it. All right, good. So now we have three circles. And right now they're on top of each other, right? So you can't really tell that there's three of them. So let's click on ellipse one copy and just move it down a little bit. What I want you to do is I want you to, in essence, make some kind of pattern of circles. So just click them and move them around so that they're kind of around the page. You can row them together. You can stagger them as a triangle. It doesn't really matter to me. All right, are we okay? We got the three circles. We kind of move them around so there's something. Now, the way that a clipping mask works is it takes a shape and cuts a picture out of it or puts a picture in it, in essence. But it only does it one shape to one picture. So what we need to do is we need to actually select together these three layers and make them one layer. 
So what we'll do is we'll click on the top one and hold down shift and click on the next one and hold down shift and click on the next one. So all three should be highlighted, right? Once they're all highlighted, you can just right click on any of the three that are there. And we want to merge shapes. So we just want to merge them all together, right? So then they're all one thing. That's really important because that thing has to be one shape so that we can put the picture inside of the one shape. So you need that little icon that basically says you draw a circle and it ends up being three circles. Now, if we were gonna do a separate image in each shape, we would wanna have a layer for each shape and cut the picture out of it. And that's what you see in advertising sometimes. You'll actually see three circles and it'll actually be a different picture or a different part of the picture in each of the circles. And when it's a different part of the picture in each circle, oftentimes it's a, it's a clip of the same image three times. So they just put a different version of it in each circle. Okay. So we need to cut something into this thing. So just for the sake of time, let's make a duplicate copy of our original mountain layer. So let's go all the way to the bottom and I'm gonna unlock the mountains RGB or whatever you called it. And let's right click on it and let's duplicate it. Whatever. Just make sure it's uh, make sure it's big enough that it'll put it in those circles. So now that I have the copy, I'm gonna drag it all the way to the top. Right? So I have my ellipse and then I have my top image. So that's my copy that I just made and I put it above the circles, right? It's above the circles. So let's right click on the image that's above the circles. And you're gonna notice that create clipping mask is an option, right? Create clipping mask. And I don't know if you can see this, but you see how the mountain now is cut out in the circles. And it's this little arrow right here that says this image is clipped into those circles. Now, so I'm gonna zoom in a little bit because the original image was light. So you can actually see it now. That's the original image cut out of, you see this a million times in advertising. There are shapes that have images that are original saturation cut into shapes with this like super enhanced image around it or vice versa. The simple image is the whole background and the circles are the merged layers of the super enhanced. So I could have done it either way. I could have merged all the layers above the RGB layer and made those circles. And I could have cut the super saturation in the circles and the image in the background would be the really neat effect. Either way, your book does a baseball guy diving for a ball and it's the same image that's in the background. They just did a shut, they, they, they made rectangles instead of circles, merged the rectangles together and cut the picture into it. It's the same technique. But the cool thing about this is it's cut into the circles. The circles have their own properties. So if we want to do drop shadows or outer glows, it'll only be the circle and the image will still be cut out of it. So you see this a lot. So if I double click on the circle layer and I do drop shadow, look at this. It's as if it's sitting on top of the paper and it's the exact same image that's behind the paper and it's cut out. It's like a really interesting technique. You see this all the time. And the image can be moved inside of the clipping mask. So if I don't want it to perfectly line up, look at what happens now. It's like a magnification of the mountain inside of the circle, the original copy moved to the offset. 
and your book actually offsets the guy diving from the image behind it. So it has like a weird shutter technique, but. So your learning module one is commercial effects. And that's what this is. It's layer manipulation. It's understanding layer formats in essence, styles. It's layer effects, which is what's inside of there. But the book does it in a way to show you professional applications. So not only textures, but textures as an overlay. Not only shapes, but shapes as a clipping mask. Not only text, but text with a pattern in it, with a bevel. It's the same techniques. It's just showing you one designer's way of doing those techniques. And next week is all about lighting. So we only deal with lighting, all the different ways to change the light source in an image to make this even more drastic. So it already has a light source shining that way. I mean, we can really make it shine that way and it will really wash out the image on this side. So each module is a different commercial application in, in essence. So from effects to lighting, and we just build up to, but this covers clipping masks and uh, pattern fills and layer effects and texture applications and the basics of your first three chapters. Now, I try to do at least a little bit of the Alla book so that you can use it as a template. You're gonna probably wanna swap out some of your pictures because you were just kind of, so I'm gonna save that. But we got, we got it started, we got it started. I wanted to be clever and make some funky state that doesn't exist or something, but we got it started. So let's just see how many technical layers we did. <clears throat> one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I do, yeah. And I like to click these little triangles just so that it doesn't show. Yeah, it makes it a little cleaner. It's easier to scroll up and down. But just know that little indent you know, this is all little icons that you see. So that little dotted square is a shape icon. This little thing is the clipping mask. The T obviously is text. Just so you get, if it has an effect, it has the FX next to it. Like just little icons. So, but this technique, the embedded effects, the layer styles, understanding filters up there basic image adjustments, like changing the mode of something, being able to stack layers on top of it, really takes you from basic to a little bit more intermediate. Advanced is when you start getting into understanding the reverse S in composition, the, the thirds method. Some of that stuff will just kind of push us a little bit further, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you just double click on the layer that is the fern, and then you click on the word fern. So these are your properties for the fern itself. The other adjustments we made were in the overlay. So it depends on what aspect of it. The global burn exists here. So it's like you're talking about this. So I I very rarely have a hundred percent opacity of anything except the original bottom image. That way it's more subtle in what we're layering, right? It's more subtle in what we're like, oh it's nice. We're getting there. Yeah. 
I'm going to stop this recording because it went for a long time. And just in case she 